Whatever their meaning, dreams always come as a series of images. One of the main difficulties in studying dreams stems from the fact that to discuss them, you have to put them into words. That is, go from the right side of the brain to the left side. But the two sides, or hemispheres of our brain, each have a different way of seeing things. In their work, lawyers, architects, computer specialists mainly use the left hemisphere of their brain. Conversely, in painters, musicians, dancers, it is the right hemisphere that predominates. However, neither hemisphere is more important or fun than the other. In almost everything we do, the two work together, even if they intervene in varying degrees. Scientists have always been intrigued by the brain. After more than a century of research, they now know fairly accurately how the roles of each region of the brain are distributed. What happens when you make a mistake in carrying out a routine gesture? Which was defective, your signal, or rather, your brain's preparation for the signal? Was there an error in spatial perception or misjudgment of the object's weight? The motor command sent to the muscle is the culmination of a host of complex operations. The brain processes vast quantities of information simultaneously. But we still know very little about the mechanisms that are called into play for even the simplest of movements. We do know that the right hemisphere of the brain commands the left side of our body, and vice versa. But there is more to it than that. Each side has its own type of consciousness. The left side of the cerebral cortex is the center of analytical thought, speech, and logic. The right side is responsible for orientation in space, body consciousness, and artistic ability. The two hemispheres are, however, interdependent. They are connected by a large network of fibers, the corpus callosum. When emotions get out of hand, a stormy exchange takes place between the limbic system and the frontal cortex. The latter regulates our impulses. If the aggressiveness builds up, the frontal cortex gets tired and can no longer fulfill its role. It becomes overloaded with emotional impulses from the limbic system, which it can no longer control. Anger explodes. If speech gets into the act, then the left hemisphere of the brain goes into action. Meanwhile, the right hemisphere, unused, rests. It seems to have cut off all contact. It's in the thinking, rational part of the brain, the frontal cortex, that we develop strategies. But a decision calls upon all our senses and all parts of our brain, especially our memory. And yet, there seems to be no specific area where information and sensations accumulated over the years are stored. It is believed that memory is spread throughout the brain. Nerve impulses can travel through our brains at a speed of 100 meters per second. Not surprising, then, that for most of our movements, the reaction time is a mere three-tenths of a second. The brain is a world in itself. It consists of some 50 to 100 billion nerve cells called neurons. To exchange information, the neurons send nerve impulses through their main prolongations, the axons. A little like a tree sends its sap from its trunk to all its branches. On the axons and their branches are located the neuron-to-neuron -neuron contacts. It is in these tiny swellings that the brain's chemical messengers, the neurotransmitters, are found. The neurotransmitters take over the impulse and relay it to another neuron. Owing to these neurotransmitters, each neuron can establish contacts with thousands of other neurons. During the past few years, scientists have discovered over 40 different kinds of neurotransmitters. They each have a crucial role in orchestrating nerve impulse exchanges.
too much dopamine could cause schizophrenia, and a deficiency of the same neurotransmitter could bring on Parkinson's disease. Many laboratories around the world are putting enormous effort into trying to produce synthetic neurotransmitters. Scientists have great hopes for these drugs of the future. By restoring the biochemical balance of the brain, they will be able to eliminate the causes of a number of diseases. Experiments on the brain, like many others, often involve laboratory animals. But other procedures have to be used to study an active human brain. About a hundred years ago, Richard Caden, a British physiologist, was the first to measure the electric activity of an animal brain. But to do so, he had to open the animal's cranium. Fifty years later, amplification techniques allowed for the study of electric activity in a human brain through the scalp. This investigating technique is called electroencephalography. Let's see how it works. A brain is constantly producing electrical currents. This electrical activity starts in the nerve cells, the neurons. The electric currents can be picked up by a device called an electroencephalogram, or EEG. This machine registers variations in electric currents occurring in a brain. For example, if a person is active, the brain will produce higher frequency electric impulses called beta waves than when the person is resting quietly. Then slower electrical impulses known as alpha waves appear. Alpha waves are typical of relaxation and daydream states. Sigma waves emerge when we fall asleep. Delta waves are those of dreams. And while electrical activity changes according to our states of consciousness, it also changes from one part of the brain to another. For instance, the group of neurons responsible for sight in a certain area of the brain presents the same electrical variations at the same time. The electroencephalogram enables scientists to specifically visualize the electric variations happening in various parts of the brain. By analyzing thousands of EEGs, scientists have been able to establish the characteristics of normal cerebral activity and conversely, to diagnose certain brain diseases, injuries or other afflictions from abnormal EEGs. To record a person's electroencephalogram, about 20 small metal discs or electrodes are pasted on specific spots of the scalp. Changes in electrical activity in each electrode are compared with the neutral activity of a zone of the body, for instance, an earlobe. Each electrode is connected to an amplifier according to a pattern that corresponds to the various regions of the brain. The feeble electric signal is then amplified and pen recorded on a graph sheet.